Okada taps out. That was a quick one, folks. That was a quick one. Hicks and Gracie continues his undefeated streak. I want to say to everyone in my division, just guys, train more. I'm coming to you. Rafael Anderson Vasiv! Welcome to UFC Unfiltered. Please tell me that's on video. I've never been happier. I'm made for a fucking podcast. That's dangerous! <laughs> Listen to me, we're out of here! All right, welcome to UFC Unfiltered. Matt and I today have a, a really good show. Uh, uh, Rafael uh, Fazayev will be here, and also a legend, Hicks and Gracie, uh, who has a new book called Breathe, A Life in Flow. Master Hickson. Good to see you, Mike, my brother. How are you doing, Matt? Uh, it's good, great to see you, Master Hickson. I thought you were taking that invisible jujitsu to another level when we didn't see you in the chair. I thought, <laughs> I'm like, wow, that shit really works. <laughs> Hickson, I'm excited about your book. I mean, this is how long, uh, have you been writing this thing for a long time? No, I have a, a old friend who is my friend for over 25 years, which is Peter Maguire, who helped me to write the book. And uh, and was just like a, something we're supposed to do for a long time. We've been talking about it. But with the COVID, with the, the spare time in my hands and with the good idea, we put it together and put it out. I hope you like it because I don't have another life to tell. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, is, <laughs> listen, this is your life story this is basically your life story yes my biography yes my my life since i was upside down in my dad's between my dad's legs <laughs> <laughs> well you started right from the beginning <laughs> right, right from the very beginning listen hey you're gonna do something like i told jimmy that none of my teachers were ever, ever able to make me do you're gonna make me pick up a book. I'm gonna get this book, Master Hickson. I can't <laughs> wait to read about your adventures in Rio. And is yeah. it about it, it now? Is it up to your fighting career in Japan also, the Valley Tudo days and whatnot? Yes, that's that's the my interpretation of how I see my own life. You know how to be born in a Gracie and be raised in the with the 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 system we already, my uncle and my father implement like to create a clan of warriors, you know? So it's a lot of conceptual things we born and raised comfortable with. And then my dealing with my own experience of competition since very early age. And then my, my, my obstacles to get the point I supposed to be, to be representative, you know, in terms of gaining emotional control, gaining the capacity to really do a job without being disturbed by, by your own enemies in your mind. So there's a lot to be accomplished in terms of conquering to, be, to get my, the point I, I get in my life because uh, we have to deal with warfare in a very, in a very complex way. If I want to be a representative of the Gracie family as a fighter, I have to fight no rules, no weight division, no time limits. Basically, you pretty much have to put yourself in a level of preparation, not only physical, but also mental, emotional, and also spiritual, in order for you to cope with that kind of challenges and, and unpredictabilities of life. So it was a life, it was my life was very excited, very much exposed to elements like Rio de Janeiro is, 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 is very, very complex place, beautiful, violent, criminal, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of things, you know, so from sex to drugs to, to violence to a lot. So it's a, it's a 
being raised in the city like that where rules are not exactly respected. It's like not civilized like the U.S. So it depends a lot of the a growing process, which put me in a very special place, and not only by being a Gracie and being exposed to that part of the family, but also being exposed to the, the ideas of walking on the street as in Rio and be, feel yourself capable to, to handle the situation. So it's, for me, my life was very excited, no regrets, put at risk all the time. So it will be interesting for people to read and see how I could cope with my problems, how I could resolve the matters. And that can be an inspiration for others getting into that, you know, the ability to, to resolve the problems because we live in, in a very turmoil times and uh, emotional control, visualization, hope, faith, are many of those invisible tools uh, a, a, a spiritual warrior can use. So today I'm really enforcing the idea of using those invisible tools for self-preservation, for, for be able to not only fight to win, but also win without a fight. You being a part of such a famous family and such a famous name, did you ever have moments where you wished like, ah, I wish I was just in, not even in a famous family or moments where you wished you could be anonymous and just kind of, did you ever have those moments where you wished you weren't in such a high pressure kind of situation? Not at all, because no. we born, we really received geese before diapers. So, and then, Based on that, you become, you born Gracie, you born eating differently, being respectfully different. People already coming to you and to your dad and say, hey, he's going to be a champion like you. So you become part of a clan even before you recognize what you are. So being a Gracie, make, me sh make sure I will eat differently. I will prepare myself differently. I will be comfortable in engagement different than other people. So it's going to be all different. So when you prepare yourself from early age, you cannot see otherwise. You cannot see yourself, you know, not being a Gracie. And it will be almost like losing your leg if you decide to not follow the pattern, not follow the... So you'll be kind of, you know, somebody who's denying your own existence. So it's not never passed through my mind. Hey, uh, Master Hickson, are, are you a, a movie guy? You like movies? Yeah, pretty much. I got so excited when I seen there was a movie called Jiu Jitsu coming out. And then I seen it. And it would, it, let me tell you, no one needs to happen. This book, Master Hickson's book, uh, you know, Breathe, uh, a, a Life in Flow, it needs to be adapted into a movie to make up for that piece of shit called Jiu Jitsu. They, how dare they use Jiu Jitsu <laughs> as the name of their movie? They should have checked with the Gracies first or something. I might swear, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, sorry about that. I'm just saying, Hollywood's going to read this book and they're going to be like, yo, wow, we, this is what we should have went with. Yeah, matter, of fact, matter of fact, Netflix already bought the rights for my, my biography. And is in the production for the last year. So Jose Padilla, which is a great director who who, who direct uh, Narco and also uh, Dead Squad from from Brazil, Brazilian movies. So he's a very recognized director. So he will be in charge of making the movie, and we start to filming. Not me because I'm just tell the story. Somebody gonna play my myself in the movie. Now, did you see who's playing you? Did you see the, or meet the actor who's playing you yet? Yes, a Brazilian guy called Kawan Raymond. He's a very nice guy. He do jiu -jitsu. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He's a good friend of mine. We surf together. We, oh. But he's younger and prettier than me, so we, I will be well <laughs> represented. <laughs> well, this is so exciting. This is even, yes. listen, as a movie guy, I'm even more excited. When, when do you think this will be a release date in this? Oh, probably the, 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 the post-production starts and then the film will be done maybe probably January, February, I'm not sure. And then there's the post-production and probably 
is still on the 19 to, I mean, 2020, 22. We'll be able to release maybe the beginning of the 23. I'm not sure. What was the hardest part of writing the book? Uh, was it remembering certain things or were there things that were hard to talk about? Was, was there anything that was uh, difficult uh, to write about? Of course, the, the, the dramatic aspects of my life, like losing my son and things, when I talk about it, brings the, the, a more present situation. I feel more like the loss than I was just thinking about regularly. So putting the, 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 the book out, I can see as I'm making the book, uh, passing through phases in my life where I make mistakes, with, like I'm a normal human being, I'm not close to be perfect. So in my young age, I make mistakes and I still not regretting those, but I think I could be out of my life if I, you know, so it's, it's important to, to embrace the, the pain, embrace the, the, the situations you're not completely happy with, but overall, uh, was a good a good thing from me because I can feel through my experience people can take advantage and overall when I look back everything I have done pull me to a better place so I've been involving as a person as a fighter as a man as a, uh, bringing the legacy to a higher level so everything was worth it even my my injuries. So when you see the book and you read the book as a whole, did it, it did kind of help put things into a certain perspective that you might not have had if you didn't look at all of it as a whole? Oh, definitely. Because now I can see my early age as a fighter, as a teacher, and then after uh, how the ego play on me and how I have to fight my ego to become humble and, 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 and favor other people. So it's a, a lot of phase in my life, and today I can I can understand my life as a with a purpose, with a much bigger purpose, because I definitely feel like the the experience I want to pass now are experience more more capable to average people do. Before I was foc if you're thinking about a triangle, I was focused more on effectiveness and 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 and, and really suppress my my opponents and how to get tighter and perceive so all the things are to bring in myself and people with me to be more effective now i feel like i'm working on the base of the the, the pyramids working more towards bringing people which something interesting is we live in a warfare today the enemy can be covid today the enemy can come in through the email and you have to have tools, invisible tools to deal with. So in other words, I've been training myself in all the aspects of warfare situations. But today, I'm physically impaired. I'm, I'm not exactly the fighter I used to be, this, the athlete I used to be. But that doesn't mean I'm not still using the tools to use jiu-jitsu daily in a very f effective way. So just my patience, just my breathing, just my, my visualization, just my strategy, just my hope, just my faith, because hope, like other invisible tools, are tools for the, the, the true warrior. You know, can you imagine in Vietnam, if people don't have hope to dealing with US, they don't have the weaponry, they don't have, they don't have the way to fight, but they have the hope and the courage to, to, to stay on the ground and either die or survive or win. So in the end up, U.S. leave Vietnam because they just felt like they, there's no victory there. So some elements I still use in daily basis are really what make me feel like grounded, you feel happy. It's because the battle today, like every, in every aspect of life, is about conquering. Happiness doesn't stick flat or, or sitting in your lab forever. In order for you to be happy, you have to know what's your next step. And when you achieve that, you're happy because either you buy a car or you get a family or you raise your kids or you, so it's always mutant elements. And sometimes just to be in peace, to be a good worker, you have to know how to strategize. You never have to know how to breathe and, and relieve from a bad email, from bad impressions. So a lot of those invisible tools are there available to you and I've been using those 
combining with physicality and aggressiveness and competitiveness. But without those, those invisible tools are still very important for people who, because in an average academy of Jiu Jitsu, for every 10 students who go in, eight will leave in less than six months. For the two who stays in, they will take the benefits of Jiu Jitsu, but also they have to come with what they have to, they have to have their courage, their capacity to handle situations, the situations of pressure and pain and ice and recovery and breathe. So they will learn through a, through a, a hard core training because they have the heart and they have the, the, the personality to handle this. But for the, for the other ones who left, they will not get exposed to all those beneficial aspects. So my proposal now is to create some kind of routine which give for those who never gonna be able to become champions or fighters, give them the capacity to, to, to evolve in their sensorial aspect, to their senses, for their feel their base, for their feel their knowledge, for their feel their grips and, and capacities to breathe and capacity to protect themselves. But even though they're never gonna fight, it's gonna be it's gonna be a few good class where they're gonna become better fathers, better you know, executives without the pressure or the commitment to go on. So they're gonna have some kind of experience jiu-jitsu without the opponent, without the competitiveness. They have training partners, they have understanding of positions and angles, which are gonna satisfy their ability to, to become better persons, but never gonna give them the ability to fight somebody. But even, even though it's very positive and very, very pro, uh, efficient for the, for the quality of their own lives. Hick, I'm you, sorry, Jimmy. Hick's no, no, no. He has an online um, course, I believe. Can you tell me about your online uh, program really quick, Hickson? Yes. Hickson Dart Academy is the new platform I create to, to serve the, the people in terms of not putting people to get crazy movements and what's happening in the tournaments, but to give fundamental aspects of how to engage, how to breathe, how to preserve your base and not be intense or, or so using less muscles, but more the ability to get the deep understanding of the execution of the techniques and also ways for you to drill and develop your senses, your reflexes, your connection, your base, your weight distribution without having to fight. And that will be a soft jiu-jitsu to appeal for 95% of the, the community. That's an I want I'm sorry, Jimmy. That's, once again, that's an online course. That's, that's uh, Hicks, what is it again? Yeah, Hickson Dot Academy. And that will provide different courses, not only for, for uh, teaching kids or teaching women empowerment or fundamentals or even belt tests and, and, and graduations. For the people that are listening, it's Hickson with an R though. Yes. Rickson. Just letting them know, Hickson. <laughs> And you mentioned the word breathe a few different times. And it's like, it's funny breathing for me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a lousy breather. Like I can breathe, but I have a hard time taking deep breaths. And I don't know if it's tension or if what it is. Do you do breathing exercises? Cause it, it's like the idea of breathing seems so simple, but if you don't do it right, it makes life difficult. You go right on the, on the boo eye of this the problem, because I, that's what I call breathe my boo. Because I was always being active, I always been competitive, I always been courageous, I always been, you know, uh, put at risk, fearless, and things like that. And when I start to learn how to breathe, because when you're born and get slapped on your butt and start, eh, eh, you breathe and alive, and you can live your life like that. Yeah. But it's a huge importance of the learning how to breathe, because something interesting is. In your brain and in your heart are the only organs who can send and receive information. The liver don't do that, the kidney don't do that, but when you feel something, it's heartfelt. Sometimes you can get depressed immediately because you emotionally involved. Or sometimes you can read something on the, on the email, read something or something and get emotionally involved. So you get depressed, you get stressed out. So mentally, you immediately re respond to the emotions. 
and and your heart so so you, your heart also respond that negativity the lungs are the only organ who can deeply be related to your heart and to your brain in order to organize to put in a different flow of thinking you can calm yourself you can you can change your mindset in the help of the breathing allowed you to really favor that kind of movement if you don't breathe properly you don't you cannot get deep relax you cannot get deep concentration and the and the difference is for everybody when you learn how to breathe by slapping on your butt you use the superficial part <gasps> And you can live with that, you can run, you can play soccer. <sighs> but that's a very short breath because that's emo- from here up, it's yeah. emotional. You have to learn how to breathe from here down. <sighs> because when you move the diaphragmatic muscle, you bring the air to the back part of your lungs, which is a real full capacity. So for you to have the idea of the air volume, you missing in every breath is this. I'm gonna empty it out, completely empty. And I'm gonna fill up just the top part. Again. Now the bottom part. The wrong one. The right one. It's almost double the yeah. amount of oxygen. Because I use the, the lungs are kind of thin on top and large on the bottom. And you just can work with the bottom part of your lungs if you work with your diaphragm. So the divers, yoga masters, uh, singers, they learn how to diaphragmatic breathing. And eventually, for athletes too, you see tennis players today, they, uh, uh, because the exhale of the air uh, make you have a, a better deep breath after. If you do wanna make a deep breath, you don't start from zero like I am right now. If I wanna start a deep breath, I have to exhale, contracting the diaphragm. Now, I feel everything. So the mechanics of the breathing system requires you to exhale first before you inhale. And people feel that sometimes I'm tired, I need air, and they try to inhale before exhale. It makes a confusion, give you panic, give you bad feelings, give you bad recovery. So if you know how to hyperventilate, you're gonna get in a zone where even when you're tired, you are relaxed, the lattice are completely controlling your body. Your brain is still very sharp because you hyperventilate and you're not that fading in your brain. If you don't do that, you not only get tired on your muscles, but you also get fuzzy and make important decisions and you get a little, it's like nothing is clear. So the hyperventilation in all forms make you get a better relax, make you get a better continuous performance power, make you recover from tiredness, make you change your perspective of things, make you calm your, your mental aspects, make, make you control your heartbeats and everything. So I've been studying breathing from 16 years old. So when I, in my 20s, I feel completely comfortable in high performance level because my mind was always keep me in at my best. So it was a very good combination. And I, I kept that from my life in terms of everything I need to a perfect breathing to cope with. So today I mastered how to fight breathing for fighting, how to breathing for surfing, but I don't know anything about breathing for basketball or breathing for volleyball because, you know, and also how to make love. I also have a good breathing for that. So do I, it's one breath and I'm finished. (laughs) (laughs) But breathing is a very, very important tool for you to use regardless if you want a maximum power or endurance or resistance or control emotional control. It's, it's amazing how much that can affect your life from just practice. 
Yeah, you're right. I do that shallow breathing. You're absolutely right. It's that it's from up here and you can feel like you can't ever fill. Like I keep feeling like I can't get that click you get when you fill yourself with breathing. And it when bothers you breathe me. too much, yeah, when you breathe too much in the upper body, you, you also uh, uh, moves the heart differently. So congests the heart, give you some kind of claustrophobic feeling if you, if you breathe too right. much in your chest. So you have to have a lower breathing to, to really control that kind of emotional experience. Jimmy, you need to go on Mr. Hickson's course. Yeah, your breathing is wrong. Uh, you make those noises that Mr. Hickson said that when you went, eh, eh, you make those noises. Yes, I do. And you still like to get spanked <laughs> on the hiney. So you yes, gotta, I do. <laughs> you got to get your shit together. You got to join Mr. Hickson's course. <laughs> yeah, the, the breathing is so, it, it's funny. You don't hear a lot of people talk about the breathing, but when you don't breathe right, you notice it. You like, I, I notice like I don't breathe correctly and it, it screws you up. You can spend seven days without food and still alive. You can spend three days without water and still alive. Five minutes without breathing, you're yeah. dead. So the idea of how important that kind of special feel is for you in, in terms of how your system works makes you feel like even a bad even a bad sequence of one minute of bad breathing can jeopardize a whole one hour of performance for me i feel like i over i hyperventilate before i get tired so i never get really tired i used to never get really tired because i get into a hyperventilation point where i get in a zone and everything smooths like like a oily machine so you don't feel tired you don't feel uh, cramps, you don't feel acid lactic, you don't feel lack of sharpness in your brains. So everything works perfectly. And I, st I used to do this for hours and hours and never get tired and line up everybody at the school or seminars and stuff and able to never feel tired. I, I was blessed with that knowledge. And uh, you're probably a good sleeper too. Breathing like that, I, I'm also a shit sleeper. So you're probably able just to put your head on the pillow and knock out. Not only that, man, when I get in an event, for example, four hours before the event in the big stages and stuff, I was deep sleeping for two hours because I make my relax on uh, breathing and I sleep for two hours. And then after that, one hour before the event, I start to warm up and put my heartbeats to 140, 106 heartbeats a minute to break the sweat and really feel good. And 10 minutes before I go to the fight, I put myself to the relaxed mode and start to breathe to relax and put my heartbeat to, heart, to 65 heartbeats a minute. So I was able to be very hot and very calm in my heart. Tum, 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 tum. So when I go to the mat, I feel like my opponent on the other side is 80, 90, and just excited. So when the bell rings, I press the gas and don't let the thing get mellow. So we all, we, we're going to go for a sprint, but I'm 65. When I get 80, he's already 110. When I get 100, he's already 140. And when, we, when I get 140, he's already 170, 180, asking for air, a little confused. And that's the time normally I capitalize in my opponents because they really get tired and they need for a little air or, or, or time to breathe. And I really capitalize on that many times. So I felt like breathing is a huge... It's yeah. a huge edge over the fighter. Let me ask you, Mr. Hickson, when towards the, you know, a lot of guys, they don't leave this sport undefeated. Now, you were in Japan taking arms home with you. And when did you say, all right, you know what? I have not, there's nothing else to prove here. I, I'm going to walk away. And then when you did walk away, were you ever tempted? Because you're watching these guys fighting. Were you ever tempted to just jump back in there and say, all right, I'm going to just take one more limb? I feel like when you read the book, you're going to see, I just not walk away. I was finishing my 2000 fight, which gave me a, a, a huge exposure in Japan. I was done something off, after Pride, which is supposed to be bigger than Pride, which is and was something made for the first time from a, a Tokyo TV. So it was a huge event. And I won this event. And a few months later, I lost my son. And at the same time, I was being proposed to fight Sakuraba for the biggest fight I could ever imagine. Sakuraba is still on top of his game. He didn't lost yet for Vanderlei and other guys. So he was just 
the Gracie Killer. And that's the fight I feel like I miss in my, in my heart, you know, the fight I like to do and I never did. But just something God decided for me. So when I lost my son, I lost the ability to fight because I was depressed. My family was, we all need to recharge and, and, and clean our hearts. So instead of being a fighter and, and focus on my preparation and, and be isolating on my preparation and, and uh, allowed my family to get away from me, I decided to stop fighting and, and focus on my family until we all heal as a, as a family. After maybe three or four years on that process, I was able to really regain strength and become seeking for happiness again. And, but at this point, I get a free agent in Japan, but because the possibilities for me to fight again, even with Sakuraba, will, require, will get me much less money than I was offered before in 2000. I felt like, you know, I was thinking for a better deal, but and then Sakuraba make losses and the situation was not the same with pride. So to go back to the arena, to fight for a quarter of what I supposed to fight, few years ago, I felt like was, you know, uh, I was not needing that kind of situation. So, and I, and I don't have to prove Sakuraba can get beat because he was already, so the, the, the fight in my heart was gone and no reason for me to go back and fight again. So that's why I, I and then I come, some injuries get worse and I was not able to keep training hard as I supposed to be. And then I diminished my interest in competition. Did, did you ever feel when, when that happened, which is such a, a terrible thing, were you ever worried that, the, that you would be overwhelmed with the grief and wouldn't be able to come out of it? Or did you always know there was going to be a way to come through it? Man, I tell you, up to that point, I felt like I was in charge of everything. You know, if I was going to surf and my, my son coming to me and said, Dad, I'd like to talk to you. I said, OK, when I come back from surf, I will talk. I was thinking about, I was in charge, I was a champion, I was undefeated, I have a beautiful family, great kids. So I have, I have everything I need. I have a car, surfboards, I have everything. So I feel like completely in charge. And when my son departure, I felt like uh, maybe we're never gonna have tomorrow. Tomorrow may never happen. So I, I have to make a shift in my mind to accept the circumstances in a different way. But in that process, until I get that point, I make sure I get myself a big 500 pound rock, put on my lab and sit on, on the bottom of the lake. I allowed myself to get sad, crying all the time and not feeling, not feeling I have to show people I'm strong. I have to prove I'm okay. Let's, so I lost, I diminished my idea to serve or to teach or to enjoy or to happy. I was just, you know, in a bad mood, feeling like I lost my both legs and my both arms, feeling important and, and completely out of enthusiasm for life. And I make sure I will stay there until something happened. You know, I was not crazy to get out of there because I felt like the hole has to be as deep as it needs for you to really, when you come out of there, you have to reborn, you cannot be the same. So that's what happened with me. At one point I decided to, I was in the hillside of my house, in the middle of the pine trees. And I climbed a tree and I saw the nice, beautiful ocean view. And I created a platform for him, a wood platform to talk to him. So for three weeks, I have a very hard work by myself, climbing the tree, bleeding my, my hands and, and making uh, harness and like climbing rock climbing harness to stay upside down and make, so I make a hard work. After that work, I felt like I was devoting my, so much power, so much energy for in that construction. I felt like I was able to relieve my soul and said, okay, now I have done for you uh, some kind of memorial, some kind of something which, and I wanna, I wanna feel like I can go free now, I can go and, and keep follow my, my my, my pet. I still make a little confused on that. And then one day I decided I, I was meditating over there and talking. And then I remember what my dad said about nothing can be completely wrong or nothing can be completely good or, 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 or right. 
every something has something kind of a dual aspect. And perceiving what's the dual aspect of myself, my son's departure made me feel happy because he, with his departure, he taught me how it's important to live the best of your day, not leaving anything for tomorrow. So today, if my daughter called me and said, hey, I'm in a free way to go to Japan for a very serious meeting, meeting. And my daughter called me, I will stop the car in the freeway and talk to her and she's crying, asking for, so I will talk to her until the problem is over. And when this problem is over, I will turn off the phone and see if I still able to get the plane, if I still able, if I'm gonna cancel. So I was able to, now I'm able to use my day in a proper, our conversation today for me is the valuable thing for today. So I will do my best to, to give my opinions and give my, my information to you without, oh, I have to do so, be focused. So in that way, I learned how to be very much 100% using my time, 100% do what I have to do and be happy with. So that's a lesson I learned based on my, my son's departure. And I have to be thankful for that because if not, I will still maybe wasting time and be not focused. So it's the only positive thing I see in his departure and I'm thankful for. Well, Master Hickson, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's it's amazing to to talk to you and, and your book, uh, Breathe, A Life in Flow. It's out now. You can get it everywhere. Uh, I will absolutely read it. You're just a really fascinating guy and just a really honest and open person. Um, thank you, Jimmy. And thank you so much for, for coming on with us. Professor, today. Professor <laughs> Matt Serra. It's always great to see you, my brother. Hey. Keep, we, keep doing your good work with the hey. Warriors. Oh, thank you so much. And as a man who makes jujitsu his life, I have my school on that every day. I'll be there later on. I'll be teaching tomorrow at the 7 a.m. class. I want to thank you because when I was 17 years old, I watched Gracie in action. I thought I was a tough guy, Jimmy. Mm. And then I saw Master Hickson fight Zulu. And he went into the cage, hopped on over the hopped over the ring. And I'm like, what is this guy? A model? What's he gonna do? First, he was a good leg. Not, he's a good looking man now, but hands up. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy, the young Hickson, you should have seen him. And little like Speedos, and he fought this man, Zulu, uh, who was an athletic freak, who was just, I'm like, how? How is he going to beat him? Dude, he got to his back, he strangled him. It changed my life. Thank you, Master Hickson. My pleasure, my brother. God bless. Uh, like, come back on when we uh, get that Netflix movie out on your life. Definitely. It would be my pleasure. <laughs> Thank All you right, guys. Master. Thank Bye you bless. so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Hey, man. Nice to meet you, bro. Oh, for me, this is something so big, Matt. Nice to meet you, too. You big fan hell. of you. Long time ago, you know. Watch your fight when I'm kids, a kid, you know, when I was I'm so old. young. Shit. I'm almost as old as my little friend Jimmy here. I'm getting older. <laughs> but hey, man, you, hey, this sport has a lot of exciting fighters. You're standing out. You are exciting, my friend. Jimmy, how yeah. would you, his ears must be ringing because a lot of people are talking about you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, that uh, what a fight against Bobby Green. Uh, he, he every time you would hit him or throw a kick, he would shake it. He does that thing where he shakes his head like it doesn't bother him. Uh, was that annoying to you, or do you not even pay attention to that? Like uh, so, okay. First one, I want to ask you guys, please don't, 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 don't speak so fast with me because I, my English is still Sorry. shit. You know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did, um, I apologize, did Bobby Green, when you would hit him, he would make a face like it didn't hurt? Uh -huh, like he, uh -huh, he uh -huh. kept yeah. he, shaking it. Did that bother you or no? Uh, yeah, when, yeah, when I kicked him, he showed me like, he, oh, God, nothing, nothing, you know. But after next day, uh, after fight, he showed me his hands. He's have uh, like big, it's have damage, you know, I I see damage after fight in his hands, but in a fight, but he, he good liar. Like he lied, when he lied me, he said, oh, this is nothing. 
I believe this. I think, wow, this is nothing, but what is that? But after fight, I think, oh, I need to kick more. Why don't you kick, kick him more? They, they call that a poker face. You know that? Poker you know face. Oh, yeah. yeah. They keep, meanwhile, inside, uh, but they don't show it. You know? Yeah. Uh, Raphael, tell me, tell us, how did you get started in the martial arts? What was your first discipline? Okay, my first discipline is it's Muay Thai, Thai boxing, and I come to Thai boxing first uh, because uh, because uh, in the school, like like uh, in the, when I come to school in uh, in the city from village, uh, like in uh, in my class people punch me, you know, because I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm scared and people punch me, my kids, you know, friends punch me, and I go. And I go train Muay Thai. Uh, <laughs> but this is my first discipline, yeah. How, how old How old were you when you started? Yeah, 12 years, 11, 11 years old. 11 years old. What made yeah. you start? Were you being bullied at school? Yeah, it, it, it's in, in, in a school, yeah. You, you, you moved uh, from the country to the city? Um, yeah, we changed because I born in Kazakhstan, in Kazakhstan, in a village, uh, but uh, we moved after we moved to city of the big city in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we moved from to from Kazakhstan to Kyrgyzstan because uh, my father, he, he worked in he worked he worked in police and uh, that's why working police in the city and that's why we moved. And I'm from village, come to big city, you know, and come to school and like, wow, everything. Oh, your dad was a police officer. Yeah. Did you want to do that when you were a kid? Did you want to be a cop when you were young? Yeah. Yeah. You did. Of course. Of course. And I, and I do this. <laughs> what now, changed your opinion? Oh, sorry, Matt. What changed your mind? Why, why did you not do that? Because the fighting? Yeah, because I I, I want to try, you know, I want to try like what I can do, what I can do in uh, in my career. When you had your first Muay Thai match, I assume you had a Muay Thai match before MMA. Yes. Did it feel natural for you? Did you know then that this is what you wanted to do for a living? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, when I when I when I fight in Muay Thai, I love it. I love Muay Thai. Uh, but but now I am tired from this. <laughs> yep. it makes martial arts is for you now. Yeah. 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 Now tell me about that transition. You were doing Muay Thai. How did you get involved with the mixed martial arts? Yeah. Yeah. It's for me. It's easy because uh, in my country, uh, when I start when I start train Muay Thai, I. I, I start fight not only in Muay Thai because my country is, is small. My country is small, and sometime, sometime, like end of week, I fight in a country championship Muay Thai, and next week, end of week, I fight country championship of combat sambo. Ah, oh, combat sambo. You know? so you yeah. Were, when did you start training the the sambo? When did you start learning the submissions, the jujitsu, the grappling? I not learn. I'm. I'm not. I'm not make drills like you know. We never. I never make drills before combat sambo. I just. Oh, we have next week. We have combat sambo championship, city championship, or world or country championship. He said, "You you want fight?" I said, "Okay, let's go." What you wait? Sixty five. Okay, let's go. And we just go. You know, we we take a gi and we go fight. You know. Oh, so you weren't even training in the in the in the submissions. No, never, never. It's no. just my, just my, uh, my natural, you know. Natural, yes, but my now, obviously, instincts. Yeah. So when did you start concentrating on the grappling? How old? Like, at oh, okay. 12 year old, you know, eleven, twelve with the Muay Thai. When did we start doing our ju our jujitsu, our samba, or training? Real, real grappling. I start practice. It's. 2015. Okay. Wow. Okay. Six years. I start. I start practice real grappling. But before this, I I do just just what I see in YouTube. 
I watch YouTube <laughs> and I go to training and I go to training and I try to do something. That's wild. Yeah, it's nice to know that works. Now, now that's what I can do. I just I'll watch YouTube and pick up a few. Uh, at least you're at least you're honest about it, though. You know, I guess you can learn a lot by watching YouTube. Uh, everyone now, if if someone see this interview, say, "Oh, this guy is top fourteen now," but he he learned in YouTube. What what the what is that? You know what though, Raphael? When I look at you fighting, you look very comfortable in there. You look like you're having a really good time. You look. Some guys are in there fighting for their life. They're very channeled in, but you, these guys who actually enjoy the fight, guys I see like guys like Tony Ferguson. Yeah, guys that are, are enjoying the combat, and I see you as that guy. What is it about the fight that makes you enjoy it so much? Oh, for me, when I when I when I am in a cage, for me this is this is real life. I think for me, like when I when I not in the cage, this is something like oh, it's okay. But when I am in a cage, for me, it's, I love it. I love this time, you know. The feeling, the feeling. Yeah, yeah feeling is, I can't explain it. Well, Raphael, uh, it, it's really, really good getting to know you. And before we let you go, like, do you have anybody in mind? I mean, you're 10 and one, ranked number 14. You're, uh, you're somebody that a lot of people are talking about after that fight of the night against Bobby Green. Uh, who do you have your eyes on next? Anybody in particular? I don't know what my kids do now. What? All right, Kami, Patricia, what did you shoot them? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, took <laughs> I got three kids too. I understand. He's he's a start fight now. You know? <laughs> That's great. Is is there anybody you want to fight next? Um, is you know for me now is I I think about Hooker, about Hooker. Yeah, they fight Hooker. With Hooker, but he want to fight now September, and uh, but September for me is. I just come back to home now. And if I want to fight September, I need to start cut weight now and start start hard work now. But before my last fight, I, I make like three months work, you know, three months hard work. And uh, for me, just before New Year with, with someone, I don't think about it now. I don't think about the fight before New Year. Whenever, whoever they give you. Whatever they give you, you're so entertaining. It doesn't matter. We'll be watching. Yeah. Hey, you're yeah, listen. You're a great fighter. You're very entertaining. We, we we can't wait to see what's next for you. Yeah. Congratulations on that great win and fight of the night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raphael. We'll talk to you another time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay, buddy. Right, bye bye. Take care, buddy. Matt, you know, we get all these things sent to us in the mail. Yes. Some of them are great and some of them are awful. What we got uh, from this company, from Panini, I, I really love it. Like I, I was a collector growing up yeah. and this brought me back to being 15 years old again. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Panini America spokesman, uh, uh, Brett Whiteley. And I really, really like these. This is an easy product to promote um, because I was happy that they sent us these. Hey, Brett. <laughs> What's up, hey Brett? How's it going? How are you? Doing good. How are you guys? Dude, I, I literally, I didn't know what was in the box when I opened it. I love these cards. Like, I collected baseball cards when I was a kid. And uh, these are like, these are almost addicting when you pick them up. They're like, they're beautiful. Um, I, I absolutely love these. Are these the first UFC cards or have there been others? Because these are by far the nicest, I'm sure. So for Panini, uh, Select's actually the second program we've done. Uh, Prism was a program that came out a couple months ago. It's a very similar technology. Those are OptiChrome cards and whatnot. Um, they're uh, by far our two best um, OptiChrome brands. Uh, yeah. where you get that kind of a plastic type card that's very shiny. Yeah. Uh, you know, collectors love to chase the short parallels and stuff like that. And uh uh, no, I mean, it select looks great this year. I mean, we opened up quite a bit here and everybody in the office loves it. How many different cards are there in the set? So the base set has 300 cards. Um, so you, what's unique about select is when it comes to the base set as a whole, um, you ha may have the same fighters that fall on different tiers. So we tier the base set. 
um, to where the it's harder to get that third tier, that octagon side. So that's why you see the different um, uh, kind of the looks on the fronts, the designs on the fronts of the cards. And actually, if you turn the cards over on the back, they will tell you which tier you got. If you got a premier level, if you got an octagon side. So the octagon sides are actually extremely rare compared to uh, the premier levels, which are the second tier, and then the just the regular base tier. Um, I don't know where it'll, my eyesight is so bad. Uh, it'll it'll say octagon on the back. Where will it say it in the bottom left? I think it's in the top middle. My it's eyes like are just that, terrible. So right there under the card number. Um, I think it's that one says concourse on it. So that's the regular base. Okay. So cards that are one through 100 in the set are concourse and then 101 through 200 are um, premier level and then 201 through 300 are the octagon side. And um, so we, we short print the octagon side ones where it's harder to get those. Of course, so yeah. Almost creates a chase within the product itself that those last 100 cards are harder to get. And that kind of goes to the brand history of select the brand history even of trading cards going back to baseball cards and where it was harder to get the later series and stuff as as product released throughout the year so these are built for an addict because i am one and i'm already thinking like i first of all they smell good i like the smell of cards and i literally want to go out and buy more of these because um like i the, the uh i have to have everything like i'm an obsessive and when you collect these, they're really, they're actually good quality. Like I told Matt before you came in, we get sent a lot of products and a lot of them are not good. And like, I was legitimately psyched when I saw how good these are. I'm like, these are something I will probably wind up buying. If I can't sucker you into another box for free, I will probably just wind up buying these um, because the idea of collecting them uh, is, I, I'm very weak when it comes to collecting things. It's the great thing with them too. And, and, the great thing about cards nowadays is there's all different types of collectors. Even you've got collectors that want to put the full set together. You've got collectors that only have maybe certain fighters that they collect and they go out for the short print parallels, the golds to 10, the tie dyes to 25, the one on one gold vinyls that uh, every single one of those parallels look great. Um, that's what the stuff in the background here. These are all the, some of the tie dyes of our NFT version of the cards, but the physical set looks like these and they're all numbered to 25 in the, in the throughout the program. Uh, and in the 200, sorry, Matt, 200s is the second level, right? Yes. Oh, great. Hey, most importantly, when is Benini coming out with the pioneer edition? Right. The legends. Ah, 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 get me on a card. I know people <laughs> I'm fucking around. <laughs> These are beautiful. I'm on the old cards. I don't want that shit. I want to be on one of these Panini cards. Yes. I know I know uh Lucas Kinzer, he's actually our brand manager for the UFC stuff. And uh so he builds all the checklisting and players list and stuff like that. I know I know he snuck a couple in in this select set. I saw I saw Chuck Liddell in there and and whatnot. So I, I'm sure it's only a matter of time. I don't care if it's me or Uriah Faber. Get somebody under 5'7 in there. Don't discriminate. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Riddell's big, tall mohawk. Yeah, you know, there's a lot going for him. All right, listen. I, I love these cards. Though. They're, <laughs> They're awesome. Beautiful. They're beautiful looking cards. Look at that. I want to show what you are one. the NFTs, by the way, uh, Brett, before I forget? The NFTs, because I don't understand that world as much, but I know that it's like the next thing that everybody is doing. What exactly are the NFTs uh, you guys have? So the NFTs that we've done um, so far, we actually officially launched our first Panini UFC NFTs um, this Monday, August 9th. Um, everything went great. We had our uh, select base packs that went on sale at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. They all sold out by the evening. Um, also later that day, we had uh, what's called a global icons. You guys may have seen some of those in your boxes there that there's an insert. Um, called Global Icons. It shows country flags and stuff like that. We try to uh, showcase a broad range of fighters from around the globe. Right. Uh, I mean, and so we had those packs go on sale and those packs actually sold out within four minutes. But NFTs as a whole, it, it, think of the trading card, the asset you have in front of you, but it's digitized. It's, it's, and it's associated with a non-fungible token is, yeah. is the terminology for it. Um, it to us, it's it's a really cool way to to utilize some of those physical tools and assets that we've created over the years that and and coincide with those to create that digital version 
of those cards. You know, it's it's not necessarily the easiest for everybody to just have physical assets and right. take, take those with you places. You know, you go to a bar, you go and see some friends or stuff like that, and maybe you want to show off some of your collection. And this is one way that you have your Panini wallet, you have that NFT, and you can show off your NFT collection to your friends as you go out. Or there's even been these great displays that I've seen people take um, you know, a 50 inch television, they take it and make it, uh, a, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll take it and they'll, they'll turn it straight up and down and they'll have kind of their NFTs scroll through as, as just to show off their collection. I mean, it's really interesting to see what people are taking with these and what they're, uh, um, how they display them. Um, but there's so much utility that's built into them. I mean, part of it is, um, we have challenge programs and stuff like that that are running right now. So with our global icons pack, we actually have one of the cards in that set is Khabib. And so he wasn't in the packs, but what we've done is we've given users the ability that over a week, um, they there's five global icon cards and five base cards that they need to collect and have their in, a, in their account after the week's over. And then they get the Khabib card. Um, so it's something where it, it, it helps us build even more scarcity within the program because right. within the NFT space right now, scarcity is king. Um, and, and being able to keep things at a minimum and just some of the utility that we can do with that stuff just over time, it, I mean, sky's the limit for NFTs. You're absolutely right. And you know the thing about NFTs, besides the fact that you can show it off, you're not going to lose it in a fire. You're not going to spill water on it. You know, you're not going to spill coffee on it. You don't have to worry about a kid in their rotten, dirty hands going and, and touching your NFT. Like there's something with it where it's not going to completely degrade over time. So if you buy it, you, you're going to have it for the rest of your life in the same condition. Correct. I mean, there was a funny uh, Twitter post I saw somebody put the other day that says, well, this is one thing I don't have to worry about with NFTs. And it was a Jose Canseco card that apparently is dog ate. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to lose them. Uh, and that, by the way, that is the way everything's going to NFTs. You know, it, as years progress, everything is going to be NFTs. So you guys are really smart to do it kind of early in the process. Oh, and I mean, the utility is endless with it. I mean, even taking something like our challenge program and, and creating reward cards for it that create scarcity in those we could have giveaways and stuff associated with those reward cards that we've already, uh, you know, began discussions on as far as giving away physical product, taking autograph memorabilia and sending it to people that um, complete certain challenges, sending people to events, doing meet and greets with athletes or fighters. I mean, you name it, the, the sky's the limit as far as utility goes uh, for these that it, it's, it's a little bit harder to do, but you, it is doable with some of the physical um, product. But with this digital stuff, it's a, it's a lot more easy, easier and obtainable. Well, Brett, um, before we let you go, where can people get these? And I, I can really tell you, I like them. I really genuinely like these, man. Like I, I would buy these myself. Um, and I thought I was out of collecting. Like I was done with any type of collecting and they're just so shiny and they smell good and the quality is amazing. And it's all guys I like. Like you I'm so sick of out. football. Co What's you that? Thought, you thought you were out and then Brett pulled you back in. It, for Brett. real, yeah. Gods. Good job. So so uh, our main website's uh, www.paniniamerica.com. Uh, there's a big old blockchain button right there in the middle that you can click on that takes you to the blockchain section of the website. Um, our three packs that we had up available for this week have all sold out. Um, the next time that we're going to have our UFC select packs available is going to be the following week after UFC 266, September 25th. Um, we'll have color blast inserts that week. We'll have gold packs, which you get a guaranteed NFT number to 10 uh, that has a gold look to it. And then we'll also have, um, we do a Dutch auction for some gold vinyl packs that have a guaranteed one of one. Um, so those are two of the most collectible as far as base cards we will ever produce for that set. So yeah, the week following September 25th on the Panini website, we'll have packs up and ready to go for collectors. Well, great job, man. And, and, and thanks for coming on and, and a really good job. The company, honestly, you did it right. And, and uh, I'm sure these will be around for a long time. So I'm going to go buy another box. Um, they're, they're tremendous. So good, good job, man. Really great job. Thank you guys. Appreciate you guys.
Okay, take care of yourself, Brett. Thanks a lot. Take care, Brett. All right, be good. Thanks for the cards. I'm a grown-ass man. You know what I mean? I'm a 47-year-old man. There's two guys that I, I really, like, look up to. Like, oh, I'm, come on. Yeah, well, I mean, three. Well, you're my friend. I mean, me and you, it's a love. But okay. Master Henzo's one, and Master Hickson's the other. I yeah. really do. You know, I, I really did admire that admire him, and I still do. What a great man. Yeah. You know, he shows life is more than just how much you can get financially and whatnot. It's more than that. Yeah. You know? Very deep person. Uh, Jimmy, what a fun show. Yeah, great uh, great talking to uh, Hicks and Gracie and, uh, of course, to Raphael uh, Fazayev. Uh, really a fun a fun show, and uh, I'll see you soon, buddy. Jimmy, I'm, I'm going to Wisconsin, so I'll be, I'll be back Sunday. I'm going to Madison for the uh, comedy on state if you want to come see me Friday, Saturday. And if not, I'll see you guys Monday. Jimmy, 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 I'm going to have my barbecue this weekend. I'm going to have a good time with that. And I will, uh, I'll see you on, I will be talking over the weekend, maybe. Huh? Yeah, we will be. We like to text. Yes, we do. Jimmy, I'm going to talk to you soon. You're the best. We're both on Cameo. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are. How desperate was that? We're both. <laughs> hey, just kidding. Jimmy, I love you, buddy. I'll talk to you All soon. Right, I love you. I'll see you. Bye, pal.